Welcome on Inside the Business of Social Podcast, powered by STN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley. Each and every episode, we keep you up to speed, your thumb on the pulse of the ever-changing social and marketing landscape. This show is no different. Before we jump into it and tell you who our guest is, this episode is episode number 47. Before we get into that, though, as you'll notice on YouTube behind me, we have a uh, beautiful new set here. I want to appreciate all the fine folks, uh, Ferker, Dylan, Dr. Dill. Uh, we have producer Will, all the all the folks for making this possible. Uh, good things are happening here at STN Digital. We are expanding. We are knocking down walls. We're relocating and revamping studios. So things are on the up and up as we head into 2020. But I did get some comments, producer Will, from some uh, some good friends in the industry that were not happy. They were used to their business of social weekly fix on the subway in the car, and we kind of ghosted them for about three or four weeks there, which I, I don't feel too good about. So. Yeah, I take direct responsibility for that. I, I, I blame you as well. All right, so 47, I don't have them in front of me. So I, I, I thought of John Lynch. Was he 47? I could be way off there. But break down for me, Will, who the hell is number 47 in the world of sports? Yeah, not the most popular number ever. Um, I think our front runner is going to be Tom Glavin. Tom Glavin. Oh, was I right on the uh, John Lynch? Uh, I can't confirm or deny. Oh, wow. Uh, I only have four here. Tom okay. was number one. Jack Morris, Mel Blunt, and Jerry is. Lucas. Jerry Lucas. Who's Mel Blunt? I don't know either. He was in the NFL. All right, guys. Welcome to the Tom Glavin podcast here on the Business of Social. Uh, we have a great one for you. We've talked to the head of Instagram. We've talked to the head of sports, Dave Sethi and TJ Adelsella. Um, and now we are going to be talking to the head of sports partnerships at Snapchat. Anmol Malihuta will be joining us here on the Business Social. I'm really excited to dig in on Snapchat. Um, he has some pretty amazing stats that I'm not going to spoil for you. You're going to have to listen. There's a stat inside this interview that's going to blow your mind because I know it did for me. But listen, I've heard from a lot of our partners, a lot of my clients, a lot of people in the space. But they kind of got away from Snapchat, right? Because they weren't sharing their data and they felt like they weren't able to really invest in the platform because they couldn't really track the ROI of engagement and analytics and be able to report that back to their bosses and say, hey, here's the reason why I'm hiring people on game days to publish our Snapchat story. And, you know, when I spoke to Anmol a couple of weeks ago, you know, he admitted that. He said that they really took that uh, seriously and they've changed that now and um, in a big, big way. So I think it makes it a lot easier for partners to invest best resources in Snapchat. And as you guys have saw, you know, the last quarter, uh, they reported a huge boost in revenue. They reported a huge boost in active uh, users. And that's really their first rebound since Instagram came out with Instagram stories and kind of hit the stock and hit user growth. So they've, you know, taken it on the chin a little bit. Um, and we'll talk about that. And then they've rebounded in a good way and continue to innovate and continue to, you know, stake their claim in this industry. It's, I think, 210 million active users on a monthly basis. I mean, nothing to sneeze at at all. So, Really looking forward to this one. Once again, head of sports partnerships at Snapchat, Anmol Malahuta. All right, he is the head of sports partnerships at Snapchat. Anmol Malhutra joins us here on the Business Social. Anmol, what's going on, man? Thanks for having me. Glad to yeah, be on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks so much, man. So I'm really excited to dig in. We've talked to... Uh, I think the head of sports, I mean, actually, the way we know each other is uh, Dave Sethi over at Instagram was uh, kind enough to introduce us to one another. Um, you know, we've talked to TJ over at Twitter, who is the head of sports and now Snapchat. So making sure we, uh, you know, make the rounds here and make sure we're, um, you know, not playing favorites, of course. No, but I'm really excited to get in with you. Why don't we start off with this? I mean, you know, sitting here as we are about to embark 2020, it's a very interesting time that you and I are talking right now because there was some time, at least from a stock standpoint, that Snapchat and user growth was kind of halting. But I mean, the last quarter, you guys are breaking records and looking really, really good. So what do you think the main reason um, for that growth or for that that great news that you guys got last quarter? Yeah, you know, I think more broadly, early on um, from a platform standpoint, it was really finding out what worked for users. Mm -hmm. So our goal is to be the best communication platform. Um, we're built around ephemerality, and we really wanted to feel like a genuine, no-pressure place um, to have fun with your friends. So I, I think what you saw last quarter was our, us really coming into our own um, in terms of doubling down on that and making Snapchat a home for, for young people to, to really engage with their friends. You know, there's no feedback loop on Snap, there's no likes, there's no comments. Yeah. Um, it's really a safe place to, to have fun and express yourself. 
So I think it's been interesting kind of the evolution of Snapchat because at first it was, you know, trying to be that um, that new company that was going after the Twitters and Instagrams. Um, and then, it, you know, it was known by Evan. He said it was a camera company, right? Um, but then I think Snapchat, you know, their, their chat feature more than anything really became a place where a lot of young people were communicating in a big, big way, almost, almost like a WhatsApp in a sense. But through those evolutions, and I know we want to get into more on the sports side, as we sit here today, like where do you think the niche specifically is that Snapchat has that really, you know, differentiates itself from the other platforms? Yeah, so I think you hit the nail there. We are a messaging platform at heart, right? So when you mm -hmm. open our app, um, you open to the camera and you're incentivized to create something to send to your friends. And over two thirds of our users actually create content, which is also, I think, rare. Mm -hmm. So uh, as opposed to just scrolling on a Discover feed, you actually are incentivized to, to create a piece of content and send it around. And then on the messaging side, as you alluded to, um, that's really our, our, our utility, right? Young people come to our platform and they use it as a way to speak to their friends through pictures and video and chat. Um, so that's really where I think we're, we're differentiated as, as people come there first. The goal for, for myself and our broader team on the content side is to uh, keep you around long enough so that you come to the content page and discover more content and learn about the world and hopefully watch some sports on Snap so as well. So it seems like the the first domino to fall is we want you to come to our app, message your friends, hang out, and then the shoulder programming aspect. If you're hanging out and you want to spend more time on our platform, it's not it's not a small piece. Obviously, it's an incredible piece that you guys have there. But it seems like the gateway drug is message your friends and get used to it, and then we're going to support you with a lot of amazing content as well on Discover. Exactly, we're we're yeah. best friends network at heart, and we want you mm -hmm. to come to our platform um, to express yourself and have fun. So as part of that extension of, of just messaging through pictures and video and chat, it also means watching content, watching short form, highly energetic vertical video um, that you also can kind of hopefully share with your friends and, then, and learn about what happened the day before. I want to say, I'm going to get kind of old school on you because you and I were talking about this a few weeks ago, but I want to say about four or five years ago when I really thought Snapchat hit something that really changed the game on social period was the famous, and I know you're a Notre Dame guy, but the famous Michigan, Michigan State game where Michigan State uh, ran it back with, you know, at the buzzer to beat Michigan. And obviously the, the, the big house was stunned in silence. But you guys did something interesting. That was when you were first coming out with um, – with kind of those discovered type stories, and you had that UGC content all around the stadium. And I remember as a sports fan and as someone that's a social marketer, I felt like I was there. And that's obviously, you know, IG Stories is doing a lot of that now, and UGC is such a big part of what we do in 2019. But you guys kind of started that whole movement. I know that's a big part of what you guys are still doing to this day. Yeah, so so the Our Story product is really our bread and butter content format. And what it really was, as you described, we geofence stadiums, events, et cetera, um, and get thousands of snaps submitted from users. So basically how it works is if you're in that geofence and you take a snap, you'll get this blue bar that pops up on your, on your screen that says submit to Snapchat's Our Story. So for that game, um, which I believe was in East Lansing, we geofenced that yep. stadium, and um, if you submitted, you could submit to the Michigan Michigan State Snapchat Hour story. And I think what's really unique about it, and what's changed for us, to be to be frank, there is that early on those stories were really just matchup based. It was yeah. Knicks versus Lakers. It was Giants versus Cowboys. It was Michigan versus Michigan State. And what that meant is we were just covering the stuff on the field, um, and pretty unsurprisingly we found that we were really narrow focused in the sense that if the game was amazing, it was obviously a nationally relevant story. But if it wasn't, only those two teams' respective fan bases would tune in. So one yeah. of the biggest changes that, that we made was focusing on everything else, the pregame, the postgame, the fans, the locker room. And the beauty of the Our Story product is that we're getting multiple perspectives. So a traditional broadcaster might have 10, 20, 30 cameras at a particular game. We have 50,000 with every fan in the stands yeah. pot potentially being a, a journalist for us. So yeah. in that particular um, event, as you mentioned, it was one of our favorite stories. You still, you still use it in some of our pitch decks. Mm -hmm. um, it was such a crazy moment where they blocked the punt and returned it to win the game. And the reaction You hear those screams, no, no. Yeah, you know, just, exactly. And I yeah. think everyone covers the blocked punt and the return for the touchdown. What we were different about is that we covered all of the reactions. So yeah. The, the beauty of this product, too, is that it's very real time. Um, and what we did, uh, and I feel bad for, for some of my Michigan friends, but we <laughs> uh, we threw up a geofence in Ann Arbor as well. 
and got the reactions from you know college kids watching in their yep. dorm or at a bar, bar yep. be. and the the way that we brought together those multi different perspectives was really a 360 experience of what it felt like to not only just be in the stadium but also be a fan around the country um which we loved yeah, and I think, listen, I mean, Barstool just kind of came out, and I'm sure you saw this, but, you know, watching the the World Series, there's Yankee and Astro fans, and they just have a camera on these guys on the couch reacting to the game. And that's why right. I thought what you guys did was so revolutionary in a way because now you're starting to see just now in 2019 people understand. You know, for me as a sports fan, it is addicting to watch diehard fans react to their team um, and it's, I think that's what your platform does the best of, um, and it's wanna, relatable. You know, I think we've yeah. all been, we've all been in that moment as a diehard fan exactly. when something crazy happens to your team in a good way or a bad way. Yeah. And part of what we're trying to do is make that relatable content, right? It's not just meant for the hardcore Michigan state or Michigan fan. It's also meant for the casual sports fan who can relate to what happened. Yeah, and anybody can appreciate, like you said, because even if you don't love sports, you you wish you loved something as much as the people do when you, <laughs> yeah, when you see their reaction. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you when you and I spoke, like I said, a few weeks ago as well. Um, you know, one thing I've heard in the industry is, you know, some sports teams and brands have pulled away from Snapchat in years past because of the lack of data um, and just not being able to, you know, look at metrics and things like that. But I know when you and I spoke, you guys have heard that feedback. And you're also doing some things to make sure you're putting numbers in the hands of your partners too. Yeah. I mean, I think early on as any early platform, um, you're always going to be lacking a little bit in, in that front. Mm -hmm. So it was almost expected to a certain extent. But as we grew and we matured, I think more importantly, um, we realized which data you know is important to brands. We took feedback from our partners. And today, you know, we have a very robust data set. Um, and in terms of our targeting, you know, now that we have users on the platform for multiple years and a bunch of content, we actually can infer who you are and what you like. Um, so if you look at my Snapchat Discover feed, I'm a massive sports fan and I engage with the ESPN Sports Center channel. I follow yeah. um, Trey Young. I watch the NBA's content. So uh, we know that I'm a sports fan and I probably like the NFL and the NBA and I'm also male. So my feed is now tailored to that. And then also from an advertiser standpoint, you can target a male for sports fan on, on Snap, which will be me. Yeah, and we've talked a lot about this on the show, and I think it's interesting, again, going back a couple of years. But when SportsCenter came to Snapchat, the reason why I think that was so, again, big for the industry, that's the first time ESPN said, okay, we're going to go to you. I mean, for so long, ESPN right. said, if you want our content – come to us. You can turn the TV on. You can come to ESPN.com. You can come to our app. But for the first time, I think especially to hit the younger demo, they say, you know what? Let's go to the people. Let's go to Snapchat and develop a, a, a program, um, you know, just for that. So I think that was, I mean, I think you agree too, but that was so huge to see ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports for the first time yeah. ever really go and say, we get it. This is big enough. Let's make something happen here. Yeah, definitely. So ESPN has been a partner since January 2015 when we launched Discover. Mm -hmm. And they, they launched with um, what we call the publisher story, which is our version of digital magazine. So think long-form articles and videos, um, very much like like, uh, like some of the stuff they have on ESPN.com brought to Snap. And I think the beauty of that partnership and our relationship is that over time, you know, we both evolved and we realized that we wanted to bring this show type format to the platform, which is again, more TV style, yeah. video and mobile. Um, and one of the things we discussed a couple years back was sports center and to their credit, um, they decided that they wanted to reinvent sports center on mobile and they chose our platform to do it. So to your point, yeah. taking that well-established IP and bringing it to a platform like ours, um, was unheard of at the time and also a huge vote of confidence for our platform, what we we're doing on the content side. So we're really excited about that. And now they have a, you know, a twice daily show, one in the morning um, that's more highlight based and funny and, and culture. In the afternoon, they take some of the traditional shows like First Take and High yep. Noon and Dan Lebertard show and they bring it to the platform um, as well. And I think what's really unique about it and what they're really happy about as we are um, is I, you and I are used to old sports center days watching yep. running back home and catch a 6 PM show on our couches. Yep. Uh, the, the average 13 to 24 year old honestly has no idea what that is. And now with this partnership with us, ESPN has created a extremely loyal fan base of sports center fans through snap. 
And the only yeah. thing they know of Sports Center is a brand on Snapchat, which is pretty remarkable if you think about it. Well, and I've I mentioned this a lot on the show. Like Vine, I think originally was the one that killed the Sports Center model. And then you have House of Highlights and you know, Instagram and just the ability to post highlights on on social. To your point, like the 13 and 24 year old, you and I when we were growing up, I had ESPN news on 24-7 in the background, watching it on repeat almost uh making me crazy in a sense. But to your point, I think the self-awareness to know like, hey, this may have been the way we've always done it, but like you said, the 13, 24 year old, they just get highlights on Instagram and they get highlights on Snapchat. And let's make sure we go to those people and continue the brand long term. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. our show with, with them is three to five minutes. If you watch it, it's, it's funny, it's informative, they rotate hosts. Um, so I think the other thing it does, you know, we're not trying to compete with, with, with them on Lenny, we're trying to add to their audience. And I think the other thing I might do is that for the, again, the casual, young sports fan or maybe even not sports fan someone who doesn't know who lebron james is or tom brady is yeah um they might watch sports center on snap and start developing that fandom because it's a really fun way to catch up with uh with the sports day and then maybe that drives them to actually watch the full show on yeah. tv so i think from that perspective we're we're both very happy with that what it's turned into and we're still innovating on it to make it better one thing uh throughout social i try to tell a lot of our clients and partners is you got to make sure this content moves and i think for Snapchat, you guys got that right out the gate. I want to use E! News as an example, because if you watch that and I, and I ask the listeners to go take a look, you'll notice it moves every single second. Every yes. second, there's a swipe, there's a motion, there's, graphics, there's a quick there's cut. Screens. And yep. talk me through the data on that a little bit, or not specific data, but I mean, I know you guys with your partners are saying you can't just post a normal, um, you know, a normal segment or a documentary and just make it vertical. It has to move, and that's what people are expecting. Yeah, you know, I think it comes back down to our foundational um, point of the platform, right? Ten second ephemeral mm -hmm. snaps. It goes away after ten seconds. The reason it's ten is that the, the average uh, attention span of a teenager, yes, I think, exactly. is eight. So uh, yeah. we we realize that we're not going to keep someone's attention anytime more than that. And similarly, from a content standpoint, it's the same thing. So th the way that we talk to our content partners is that you have to tell your message in a fun, quick, high energy way. And that's why you see those motion picture graphics, split screens, yeah. et cetera. Um, because I think what we all understand today is that you can still reach this audience. It's just, they're just consuming content in a very, very different way. And our platform is doing it uh, – to hopefully reach that that younger generation. So talk me through the 13 to 24 year old demo because you were sharing some data with me when we spoke before the show. Um, some, was it 90 percent on the either on the platform or sports fans or what's that 13 yeah, to 24 so, demo? So 90 percent 13 to 24. Um, so we, we we reached 90 percent 13 to 24 in the in the U S. and 75 percent 13 to 34. We now have over 210 million daily active users. Um, and there's more than three and a half billion snaps created by the snap cam. So wait, you're reaching at all the 13 to 24 year olds in the United States. You're reaching 90 percent of them. That's correct. That's I mean and, se and seventy five percent of thirteen and thirty four year olds. So so I think that's really important, right? Because um, to, well, if you're any your brand earlier, in the world, you have to be there. I mean, I'm saying yeah, you have to be there. Hundred yeah. percent. If you're trying, if you want to reach the younger generation, you have to be on our platform. Um, and I'm sure you've seen this too. If you're at a sporting event, if you're at a concert, and people have their phones out it's and they're it. they're a teenager, I guarantee you they're on yeah. Snap. And yeah. I think you made a really good point earlier from a messaging standpoint. That's also their primary communication platform. So that's mm -hmm. what they're, te they're texting their friends on. Um, so it's really where they are, which is important to us. And then for my world in sports, it's it's the same thing, right? How do we make sure that that we're reaching these people in the sports world, especially from the traditional leagues and broadcasters and rights holders? So let's break that down for a second. When you talk to the NBA or you talk to the Lakers or you talk to the Patriots, you know, whoever these partners may be, um, what are the main things that you're telling them to do in terms of uh, content, how to best utilize the platform? Are there some, you know, for the listeners, some quick t uh, tip, tips and tricks that you recommend because you're in it every single day? Yeah, so I would, I would describe our league in broadcast relationships in basically two phases um, so far, and we're about to enter the third phase. The first phase was really getting the best events on the platform. We wanted to make sure that we had Super Bowl coverage, we had NBA Finals, we had the Olympics, um, we had the World Series, and so on. So our goal there, again, is to take that um, short-form, mobile-first storytelling strategy with these leagues 
uh, and work to a place where we can cover these events in our Snapchatty way. So yeah. that was really our, our goal the first couple of years. And, and what our team was um, tasked for was really to uh, talk to the biggest partners in the world, the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, the NHL, ESPN, Turner, NBC, mm-hmm. um, and get those those events on the platform. And and what that coverage was, was a combination of us producing those hour stories that we discussed where we would geofence the, the stadiums and then we would curate those stories. And the next, the next piece of that was the actual partners creating shows or publisher stories like we talked through with ESPN. Um, and, and there, honestly, it, it was pretty simple because we just wanted to cover the event in a different way. So from yeah. the our story standpoint, it was really UGC-based, multi-perspective format. Um, what it evolved to is that some of these leagues wanted to, to produce on the platform like traditional publishers because early on it was really just Cosmopolitan, BuzzFeed, et cetera, folks you would expect. Yeah, and early on, you couldn't upload from your camera roll. Like, you either did it inside the app or exactly. nothing, right? Exactly. So. Yeah, and you had to hire a team to do it. And then the NBA yeah. and NFL saw this and said, we want to do this. Um, and they really proved us wrong. They hired out Snapchat people, and they started producing this publisher story format, which is the magazines, um, during off days, right? So for the NFL, they produced on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and yeah. Saturdays. And I think what's really important for them is that they now had a, a portal to our audience that they could kind of talk through, right? And it wasn't just about game days. From the hour story game standpoint, there's only so much that we can cover on a game. And now with the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, publisher stories that the NFL is producing, they could talk about everything else. Fantasy recaps, insights, yeah. analysis. And it became really their way to tell Snapchatters what is important for an NFL fan today, right? Um, and all throughout the season, which is really interesting. So that was really phase one. It, it was um, getting the, these folks on the platform and telling their stories in our way, right? Which is less than 10 second top snaps, um, high energy, multi-graphic. Yeah. How do you grab people's attention that are in the younger generation? And that was really our, our focus there. Mm-hmm. And then as I mentioned earlier, pivoting and covering shoulder content. You know, uh, we, I think one of the things we really did a good job of was not just tailoring our content to the hardcore fan, me or you, hardcore male fans. It was also for the casual fan to, to relate to. So that was really the covering the tailgates, um, covering some of the player stories, covering stuff in the locker room which we think is is relatable to all types of fans. Um, so that was really kind of what we evolved to. And then I'd say um, kind of the, the next phase was really getting this more produced content, which is shows. And that's what we do with ESPN. Um, the NFL also has five shows running per week today as well. And that you know was either one of two things. You, you take a traditional um, established IP in Sports Center's case for the NFL. They took Mike Depp last year on NFL Network. Um, they have the check down as well on Snap, yep. or we, you know, they might they might think about a new property on Snap that they're thinking through. So that was again another way to um, streamline something entirely new for from a league or a broadcaster standpoint that they could again utilize um, our platform as the place to do it. And I think the last piece is really um, the next phase. I know we were discussing a little bit last time we spoke. Yeah, was the next two layers of content for us, which are teams and athletes. Um, so our our goal. You know, uh, what I hope that we have on the platform in, in the next nine to 12 months is this very unique storytelling atmosphere where you have um, the top layer of the funnel with the league providing highlights from the biggest moments happening that's very nationally relevant. Then the next layer of the funnel is the teams providing that localized everyday content for the hardcore fan in that area. Um, and then lastly, the the players um, providing that really behind the scenes stuff that you can really only get from from their um, perspective. So yeah. we envision that being an extremely unique, differentiated way to cover an event um, from top to bottom. And that's really what our goal is as we think about the sports ecosystem over time. Those uh, people that are listening that are on Snapchat or, or uh, don't have their brand on it yet, um, without pay- playing too many favorites, are there any brands, uh, maybe like a, a Turner, ESPN, maybe a team that you think is doing it right that you think would be a good uh, must follow to kind of learn how to do it the right way that's really performing well on your platform? Yeah, you know, I'd say they, they're all different uh, in, in a sense. I think, I think what's cool about our platform, it's not like, you know, we go There's not a recipe. To, yeah. Exactly. It's not yeah. like we go to a partner and say, um, you have to do this. And if you don't do this, you're not going to succeed. Right. Um, the beauty, I think, of what we do is that it's kind of a, a blank palette for some of these partners. And we're just giving you the tools to succeed. And for mm-hmm. some people, it's, it's uh, 
XYZ tools for other people. It's ABC tools, right? Um, so I would say, uh, to walk through a couple of them that I think are really interesting, some of these partnerships, but, Love it. uh, what the N- NBA and NFL do really, really, really well is they're making this content for mobile, right? So it's not just, they're just cutting down, uh, stuff that they have on linear other properties and just starting on snap. They're really customizing it and and making it uh, something that resonates with the Snapchat and with our users. And same with ESPN and SportsCenter. If you watch that, you know it looks entirely different than SportsCenter on, on on linear because they made it for our platform. I mean, right? even and down really, to like they're wearing T-shirts and hoodies. They're not wearing. Exactly, you know what I'm saying? And exactly. That, that's, that's important. Yeah. Which is relatable to the 15 year old, much yes. more than someone wearing a suit. So yeah. um, that's really important to us, and I think that's where you'll see some of the best practices there of real creating something unique to the platform that speaks to the younger generation um so those are you know a couple examples there from a broadcaster standpoint we have we have a great relationship with turner around march madness uh, yeah. with nbc around the olympics and obviously you mentioned e-, e news the rundown and stay tuned on the news side mm-hmm. um and a handful of them that are in games as well for nbc of course uh and then you know with, with some of the other ones that i think are pretty unique to us today we announced a deal with the zone last week um, in the combat That's sports right. space. So yeah. we're really trying to expand um, outside of just doing, you know, some of the, the traditional league and broadcast relationships and looking at things that do really well on the platform and combat sports is something that, that we've seen um, drive a ton of engagement. So, that's something that's new for us. I'm working with that type of platform as well. Uh, and again, I think all of the the best practices that we give to these partners is really around building a loyal following on our platform that's meant for mobile first users. That's awesome. Just as two sports geeks, I'm sure you saw this, but did you see that uh, for the Canelo fight, the UFC and the Zone kind of worked they it out. Where they, it. Yeah. yeah, but they yeah. MGM called Dana White and UFC like, hey, our fans are freaking out. We're just sitting here waiting for you to end. Are you cool if we broadcast the Nate Diaz fight on our big screens before the Canelo fight? And Dana White's like, sure, I don't care. Right. And um, that's pretty incredible. Like for two, you know, two brands like that, they're comp- complete competitors in a way, especially with Dana White's uh, history with, you know, Oscar De La Hoya and all that, right. like that, that went down, but that, that was pretty cool to see. Um, so I guess on, on the zone, um, what do you kind of see them doing? How do you see them leveraging the platform the best? Cause they're going after those subscribers and then young demo as well. Yeah. So I, for them, what we announced, we're doing a couple shows around the main fight. So we did some stuff around Canelo over the weekend. Um, we're going to do some fighter profiles that goes through some highlights. Um, they have their 40 days platform that we're bringing it onto snap as well, which is going to be really, really interesting. So, so that one for us is, is also unique and exciting because, you know, they're relatively new. So, and so they're already expect- producing a lot of original content. I mean, around Correct. the Correct. They're already so, producing yeah. a bunch of original content. And yeah. I think for us, you know, it's really exciting for us to get partners like these because they're only going to grow and evolve over time as we continue to do. So, mm-hmm. um, to the point we were talking about earlier, you know, we're not trying to build the Coliseum that's going to be around for a thousand years. We understand that we need to adapt and change. Um, so, we love partners like this who we know are in the same environment that we yeah. are. And I think, you know, what, where we're unique as well is that um, there isn't a, hey, you have to do this. And, and if you don't, you're not going to succeed. It's a let's partner together. Let's see what works. and Let's continue evolving on top of that and making it bigger. So um, right now it's just a couple of shows around the major events. Um, it's fighter profiles. And as you know, we know their portfolio is going to grow. Um, we're going to continue to kind of innovate and see what works with them as we move forward. That's awesome. Um, what are some of your biggest athletes currently on the platform? We got a bunch of great ones. So, um, I'd say the, some of the ones that, that I like to follow the most, uh, Saquon Barkley is great. Mm. Um, Trey Young is really, really good. Uh, Juju as, as probably unsurprising to you, yeah. uh, given how good he is on social, yeah. um, is really funny and he has a bunch of segments with his dog, which we love. <laughs> um, Serena Williams is really good. Lindsey Vaughn is really good. Um, so we got we got a really good uh, I think base of athletes and you know one of the things they always tell us is that they love our platform because because of the ephemerality aspect and I think in some other places they might feel um, some pressure or some mm-hmm. unwanted bullying because some one person misinterpreted what they said and it's there forever um, whereas for ours because it goes away there's there's a lot less of that um, you know social pressure to 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 what they're posting and then I think the obvious thing is that 
again to what we were saying earlier, um, it's just it feels like it's more genuine and, and more authentic in, yeah. in the way they use their platform. So it's the same discussion we had earlier of why partners come on the platform. It's the same for these athletes. If you want to reach the younger generation, which is really generations that's going to drive you. Um, mm. when you retire right one day, yeah. you have to be on this platform to do it. How, how much do you think the 24 hour, um, technology that you guys really started, how much do you think that goes into your ultimate success? Uh, I, I think it's, I mean, I think it's really important, right? So, you know, at any moment you can be a content creator on the platform, um, and you can, you can take out your phone and, and take a, a picture or video and add a funny filter or lens or doodle on top of it. Um, and make it a piece of art that's yours, right? So we're really trying to promote creative expression. And again, just, just that self-expression of being yourself um, is extremely important. So I always find myself on Snap when I'm when I'm snapping my friends or my colleagues or my family. Um, I don't think twice about it, right? It's not like I need to look at it 100 times and make sure that it's perfect. Yeah. It's, it's who I am in the moment, uh, which I think is really, really important, especially in today's day and age. Talk me through um, your best practices on how to grow a following. Let's say I'm the XFL, for instance, and I want to hop on your platform. Um, you know, sometimes it's difficult to, to see if, A, is, is this brand actually on the platform? Can I search for them or find them? Um, and I know, you know, obviously, I guess your average advice would be to post on your other platforms. But is there kind of a, a best practices once you actually say, you know what, you're right, I listened to this podcast, this is ridiculous, I got to reach my 13 <laughs> to 24. Uh, how do you how, how have you seen uh, brands properly launch and make sure people know that they're there daily creating? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So uh, I think that, you know, one of the harder things is that, because it's such a younger generation and because there's so much other content on the platform, you know, it takes a little bit of time to, to build that following. But once you do, it's going to be really sticky, right? And once yeah. you uh, establish yourself as an interesting, unique content provider that when you post, um, people want to watch it, they're going to continue coming back. Um, so what we usually tell people early on is – Again, find your voice on the platform. We don't want to be your voice. We want to give you the tools for you to succeed, but find your voice on the platform. Um, it's not about posting every single day or every hour a day, and I think that's probably one of the biggest uh, mistakes that happens early on when when you just post too much because then becomes – you know, uh, is this actually special for me as a user to come click your content anymore? Yeah. We want to make sure that, you know, as a either an influencer, or an athlete, an individual, or the XFL, um, what you're posting is relevant, interesting, and hopefully piques the curiosity of somebody to click into your tile that day. Um, so we always tell them to, to make it, again, relevant, exciting, and you mentioned a lot of these earlier, um, you know, shop for snap don't just yeah. copy something that you did anywhere else yeah. because our users are smart and they'll realize that it's not it wasn't done here yeah use some of our really cool creative tools our camera tools like lenses and filters we can talk about a little bit and then yep. um as you mentioned you, we have this uh a qr code called the snap code for 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 everyone essentially um so once you've kind of developed your account and started your snap code and you have your snap code your qr code you post that across your other social channels so that when users scan it, they can actually jump right into it on the app. And then, you know, uh, to your point earlier of like the searchability and discoverability function, we've really enhanced that pretty drastically over the last year or so. Good. Um, yeah. So now if you search uh, ESPN, for example, on Snapchat or Sports Center, you get uh, driven to their profile page, which actually has all the previous episodes that they've run, you can go back in time and watch it. And it that's has, awesome. you know, has a, a nice homepage for them. And that's, that's brand new for us more recently. So, um, that's kind of the way that you can kind of keep that following. And again, if you're a hardcore XFL fan or a hardcore NFL fan or hardcore sports center fan, you can go back and find that page, um, which is really unique. And the last thing is that if you are creating some of our camera tools like lenses, you can actually, uh, tag and permanently save those, those lenses on that page as well. Um, so if, if the NFL were to create a really cool lens for opening Sunday, um, in the past, if you missed it that day or that week, you might not be able to go back and find it. Whereas now you can actually, as, as a fan go and, and use that again. That's great. Um, yeah. So for Twitter, you know, when I post this podcast, if you retweet it, I may get some followers based on that, right? With the Instagram, you have the explore tab. Are there any other ways that I'm not thinking of that people could stumble across your content inside the Snapchat platform or when you're developing your account from the from the infancy, 
you got to find a way to get it out to the masses and on different platforms. It's a little bit of both. So if yeah. I was watching um, one of Saquon's snaps after the Giants hopefully beat the Cowboys tonight, <laughs> and I, I were to send it to you, um, you can then swipe up within that that message and then subscribe right. to him. So, right. uh, and the other piece too is that we're getting athletes to actually post like you or I do. So same example tonight, Cowboys Giants game. Um, I'm going to the game and I can take it, try and get into the story that we're covering and post to the hour story and see if I get selected. Saquon can do the same thing. So, so before the game or after the game, hopefully he's using his phone when he's allowed to, not not during the yeah. game. Yeah, don't on. Antonio Brown it, please. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he can. Um, so, so let's say in the locker room after they win, he can he can post a snap to the story and we'll include him, and then he gets attribution. And then if you're watching the story tomorrow or later tonight. Um, you can swipe up again in that actual snap of the story and subscribe to, subscribe to him and follow him. Awesome. I want to get into lenses for a second because I think that's what you guys still do better than, I mean, light years ahead of everybody else, even though others have, of course, copied. Um, but the <laughs> the baby filter, I want to just talk about that for a second yeah, because that, like that went viral. And I'm wondering from someone in your standpoint, when that goes, I mean, I saw that on Twitter and Instagram way before I saw Inside Snapchat. Yeah. Um, is that good? I mean, do you look at that as a as as a win because of that brand awareness and people end up going to the platform, or does it kind of hurt when a bunch of people are posting it on uh, on the rival platform? No, we we love it. You know, I think it uh, it speaks to a couple things, right? I think one, uh, what people underestimated. I think a lot of people just assume we just came up with it last week and then posted it. That type of tech was like a year in the making, right? It wow. takes a long time to have that that sort of. Um, ability to to recognize your your I mean, facial hair and baby Stephen A. Smith is what comes to mind. I mean, that's that's everywhere. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. so the other thing that we did. So uh, I I think again. So it speaks to our, our tech and our innovation on the camera side, which is really important to us. Mm -hmm. um, and we can use that for a lot of things over time. So that's number one. Number two. You know, one of the things we did shortly after we 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 made that because it's unbelievable, right? It's super fun. Yeah. Um, it's really really hilarious. We went to you know some of our partners like ESPN and Turner and just said, hey, you guys got to check this out, um, and they started utilizing it in segments, right? So you see the ESPN, ESPN, yep. which is really funny. They also did a segment just Barkley, showing, I so, think, too for Turner. Yeah, yeah. and then on, yeah. for for Inside the NBA, they uh, they actually had a segment where they had the phones out and Shaq, Kenny, Ernie, and, and Chuck were using it live on air, which is amazing. And again, awesome. what a really cool way to drive engagement to us. And yes, we love it because it's a way for people to understand that we're doing really innovative things um, you know, with our, our camera t marketing tools and then also you know, driving people to the platform to hopefully use that lens and, and share with their friends. I mean, from a marketing standpoint, is there any way that you guys have thought about making sure people understand that came from Snapchat, because obviously with Instagram and Facebook and their lenses, as we go throughout the next couple of years, it's gonna be kind of difficult to say, where did that actually come from? Um, do you just look at it from a word of mouth standpoint? Like, how do I do that? Like, oh, dude, go to Snapchat and do like this. Is that kind of the end game? Or is there a way to somehow brand these filters in a way where you know it came from Snapchat? Or does that kind of kill the, the whole thing? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's a good question. I mean, yeah. so when we did it and, it and it kind of blew up, it literally broke the internet in the first couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, our, our snap lens team account on Twitter posted a bunch of times and they, and they basically compiled all the really funny ones that you discussed plus a million more. Um, pretty much saying, by the way, this is us. Don't, don't get it twisted. Yeah, type thing. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Exactly. And then, well, not just, I mean, I think that that's obviously part of it cause you want to make sure that people understand that it was on our platform, <laughs> yeah. but it's also, you want people to see like, this is powerful, right? Like the amount of people that were using it, the amount of athletes and celebrities that were mm -hmm. using it. Um, is was really unbelievable, right? And then you know when you see ESPN or Turner use it in segments, they always very clearly state that this is this is a Snapchat right. lens. Um, so I think naturally, uh, it's not something that we're we're too worried about because people generally tend to say, hey, you gotta try this new lens on on Snap. Um, so it's not really an issue. Then obviously, from our social standpoint, we're we're always gonna. Um, show things like that through our, our official accounts. I've always been um, fascinated with this, but obviously, you know, Instagram stories uh, uh, was a complete, you know, like copy cat of what Snapchat did. And then now you have the lenses and things like that. From where you sit, um, do you look at that like, you know, Twitter started hashtags and now other platforms have hashtags. Like, is that just a, a notion to the industry that you constantly have to evolve and don't don't feel like you own anything at any one time? Um, or yeah. do you feel like, I mean, how do you kind of approach that when you guys have it and then it starts to 
Yeah, so I think it's a couple things. I think uh, especially in our industry and especially with the demographic that we're targeting, you have to be innovative to continue to succeed in this environment. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, it's super important that we continue to evolve our products and our product guys have things cooked up that you know we don't even know about that are well down the line. Um, and I think from from that standpoint, you know, of course, there's always going to be some sort of um, you mentioned the Twitter hashtag piece, et cetera. There's going to be other platforms or something similar. You know, in a weird way, it, it helped us because we were really the first platform that uh, pushed vertical video. That was yeah. the, we were always that platform from yeah. day one, whereas everyone else was horizontal. And that was a challenge early on because both content creators and, and advertisers said, hey, they wait a second. They frustrated by it, yeah. Right, yeah. we're creating everything else horizontal for every other platform, and you guys are the only one we have to make bespoke creative for. It was difficult for us to get um, scale there, mm. right? And then when, when that happened, um, the market moved. And, and now it's become, everyone says this is, this is, this is what they do full time, which helps you know, us as well. So it kind, of, it kind of helped everybody in that sense. I'd say, you know, when we think about our strategy going forward, all of our um, pieces are, are supposed to kind of sing together. What I mean by that is that our content, our lenses, our filters, our messaging, our Bitmoji, mm -hmm. you know, we're all thinking of those pieces as part of our broader ecosystem. We And we have obviously have a plan for all of those together um, over a period of time. So if someone takes one piece out of that um, and emulates it, that's great. As long as we continue to innovate um, and keep thinking through how our ecosystem works together, we're going to be just fine. Yeah, I guess uh, imitation is a what's a form of flattery, right? So we got to right. exactly. roll with it. Um, I know we only have a couple minutes left, but um, anything else that we're missing in terms of partners, brands about, I guess we're staying in the sports uh, field, obviously. I mean, you mentioned Lens and the ability to geo fence and all that different things, but what else are we missing? What else should the folks know about what Snapchat's doing? Yeah, you know, I, I talk about the Lens stuff for a second. I think mm -hmm. what... You know, another big misconception for our platform is that, um, especially in the sports world, that it's just content relationships. That all we do with the NFL and the NBA and ESPN and Turner is partner on content. And I think one of the, the big, bigger pieces of the bar that's grown pretty drastically over the past 12 to 18 months is actually everything else. Um, augmented reality, lenses, mm -hmm. right? The filters we have at every stadium, um, Bitmojis. You know, we acquired Bitmoji a couple of years ago, and one of the first things that we did was go to the four major leagues um, and do deals with them so that now you can actually dress your personal avatar and all your favorite team's outfits, awesome, which we man. think, again, is really, really unique and different because you can express your fandom on the app through Bitmoji. Yeah. And you know, in a world where profile pictures almost everywhere else are such a taboo and sensitive nature for, for people, uh, they almost shy away from them, we find that Bitmojis has become this extremely fun way for self-expression that people love. And it's like their mini version of themselves. So mm -hmm. we really like that aspect of it. And then on the, on the AR filter stuff as well, um, you know, having the, these lenses in stadiums with the NFL for opening kickoff weekend, we had helmet lenses um, geo-targeted around the country. So if you're in New York, that, yeah. you could put your head um, – in a, in a Giants or Jets helmet. What am I supposed to do is in San Diego, though? I, I, you can't have the Chargers out here. I mean, you got too much. That hurts. You know? Yeah, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> you, you can probably get, you can you probably go to LA a couple hours up. You can get, yeah, you give can me get a Rams, Rams helmet. No Chargers helmet. All right. Yeah. So, so that's really neat to us, too, again, because you're, you're allowing people to, to okay. again, use the, those lenses there. And, you know, uh, it, we were really proud. Uh, it was last Super Bowl in 2018. Verizon announced that Snapchat was the number one most used app in the stadium. Um, and usually the stadium, that, as we perceive it, is, is generally be people wearing suits and ties. So it's another uh, way for us to showcase all of those amazing tools that we've added to stadiums mm -hmm. to, to talk to your friends. And it's not just watching content. It's using a filter to add that contextual overlay. Um, it's using the lens again to, to really have a playful expression of what's happening and so on and so forth. So That's we're awesome. continually trying to enhance those in-stadium experiences as best we can. And those are through all the camera marketing tools that we have. And then talk me through as you guys head to 2020, are there any fun um, innovations or things that you're, you're going to try to bring into the sports world that may excite some folks on the brand side? Yeah. You know, one of, I think the, the more unique events that, that we see every couple of years is the Olympics. So, mm -hmm. um, Tokyo 2020 is obviously a, a big couple of weeks uh, circled on our calendars because we think that we can just tell those stories in such a unique way, in such a global way, especially some of those content formats that we mentioned. Um, so we're really excited to, to bring that back to Snap and 
Um, we're working right now with with a bunch of the the broadcasters in the IC um, and a bunch of other partners to to bring this global um, event, which really is a cultural phenomenon every two years, to our platform through all of our content offerings, through the UGC Multi Perspective Hour Story, through the the published story digital magazines, and through the TV style shows, along with all of the cool lenses and filters that users can use um, around the world. And I think what's great about that again is that it's really dynamic. We can have a different story in Canada and in the U.S. and awesome. France and the U.K. Um, and it's again, we love when people can express that pageantry and fandom. Um, and there's no better place than do that for your country than the Olympics. I love that. Uh, we'll look forward to that. Um, I always ask this at the end, but if there are anybody in your network that you would recommend uh, that we talk to or set some knowledge on listeners, anybody come to mind uh, in your uh, in your network? Yeah, there's plenty. I'll have to send you an email <laughs> after this. Uh, right. There's plenty that I've learned okay, from. Good. I don't know if I can name one, but uh, there, you can't play favorites with your partners. I get it. I get it. I'm not yeah, going to put you exactly, in that spot. Exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll get an email. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, man. That was that was awesome. I'm really excited about what you guys have done and like all the good momentum headed into 2020. Um, it's, and it sounds like you guys are picking some of those moments like the Olympics to potentially release um, new features and content. So we'll uh, we'll look forward to all that, man. Definitely. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed Th it. Thanks so much, boss. Take care. Talk soon. All right. I dropped some knowledge. I think it makes me feel bad that I'm not telling all my clients to be on Snapchat immediately. I mean, that stat that I told you guys to look out for, I'm sure you you heard it and you heard it clear. You saw my reaction. 90% of all 13 to 24 year olds in the United States are on Snapchat. That's a crazy, crazy number. Um, so, I mean, if, if you want to hit that younger demo, which who doesn't, right, um, for your brand, for your network, for your team, you know, you have to be on it. But I like what he said, you know, there's, you don't have to post every single hour, every single day, but you have to have some type of presence on it. And I really wanted to dig in that. The few things I've seen with Snapchat was A, the data. I think they have that figured out. B, when you start posting, how do you get, um, how do you get, you know, users, right? How do you get followers? Because with Twitter, you have the retweets. With Instagram, you have the explore tab. Um, and he shared some insights there on how to really let people know, hey, we've arrived. We're on Snapchat. We're now investing resources in this. So make sure you follow us on Snapchat. But they're doing a lot of cool things. They mentioned the partnership with The Zone, which I think is really interesting. But um, you know, not only are they trying to go more after teams and players, but now internationally. It's going to be really interesting for the Olympics, Will. I'm excited because think about it. If France beats Team USA, you know, in, in basketball at the Olympics, there can be geofenced reactions from France of people in bars in France reacting to that victory. And uh, who doesn't like that type of content on sports? Yeah, I think like you said in the interview, I, I there's only so many times I can watch the actual highlight itself. When you get to see the fan reactions and the real time stuff, that's really interesting. And listen, they've paved the way. I think, you know, one thing you can do in a Snapchat world um, obviously, if you invest in the platform and, and put resources towards it, but also they've really been innovative. I mean, he brought a point that I totally forgot about vertical storytelling. <laughs> I mean, they set the stage there. And now we just look at it with IG stories and Facebook stories and IGTV. You know, we all just consume our content in a vertical format. But Snapchat started that. Snapchat started lenses. Snapchat started 24 hours. So at the very least, it's important to, you know, format content and understand what they're doing because they've really set the stage in a really big way. There's going to be copycatters and I really don't get into the copycatting of social because that's just our industry as a whole look at every radio or every tv show every game show you've ever watched is you know stealing and kind of an evolution of a previous game show or a previous concept you know you look at um you know comedy shows or any type of sitcom it's all kind of copying stuff that's worked in the past so I understand that's that's the industry and look at Netflix they opened up a window and now everybody like what are they doing? like you know 36 different streaming platforms now are just copying that model because it's it was revolutionary, but it worked, and that's where the industry is going, and that's where people like. So, you know, social is always going to be that way, but it seems like, you know, Snapchat's found a great way to continue to innovate, continue user growth, and um, it's definitely an important platform and, and something not to forget about when you break down your social strategy for 2020. All right, there it is, Business and Social Podcast. You know, we found out here later that Mel Blunt 
was a former Pittsburgh Steeler. I think of um, Lindsey uh, over at NBC Sports would be very upset with me, uh, who was on the podcast. He's a, uh, I think, SVP of marketing over at NBC Sports. So sorry, Lindsey, if you're listening. Um, but yeah, this has been another edition. Thank you so much to the head of sports partnership, Amal Malahuta. That was an amazing, amazing program. Uh, great, great knowledge that he dropped for all of you. Hope you enjoyed it. All right, we're back. We're back on a more consistent schedule. We promise, right, Will? We you giving us giving the listeners that promise. Back in your life. Back in your life, back and better than ever, as Mike Greenberg would say over at ESPN. All right, there it was. I want to thank Ferker, Dylan, producer Will for all their help on the show. This has been another edition of the Business of Social podcast powered by STN Digital.